Hey everyone, Dr. Jake Gordy. So this is video two in a series where I'm breaking down this paper here. This is a piece of research that I was involved in. So make sure you go back and watch uh, the video one in the series, and that goes through the justification for this research and some of the early results. Now, the first results that we get from figure one is that there are a small group of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, very common drugs, that inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome and not the other inflammasome. So this is a, a semi-selective NLRP3 inhibitor and they are a small group of NSAIDs that we know are safe to take. So it's very exciting research. In the next couple of figures I'm going to break down how these drugs work. Now this is always a terrifying thing to try and do. Discovering how a drug works is incredibly difficult. Paracetamol, which we've been taking for decades and decades and decades, we only really probably figured out the mechanism in 2017, and we're still not 100% sure, but we think it might be something to do with cannabinoid receptors in your spinal cord after being digested by the liver. So paracetamol gets digested by the liver into another drug, <laughs> and so it's a very complicated pathway. So when we went about this to try and discover how our NSAIDs might be inhibiting NLRP3, we were a little scared. This could be a never-ending project. Now, I will say, I might just bury the lead a little bit. We were very sure by the end of this paper the mechanism of action on how this how these drugs work, but it turns out, a subtle twist, we were wrong. And I'll tell you why we were wrong later, and we didn't really figure out we were wrong until another four years after we published it. So let me jump into it. Here we go. Okay, so quick refresher, we've got uh, the NLRP3 pathway here. So first we get NF-kappa-B activation. That causes the production of pro-interleukin-1-beta, which is not an inflammatory form of interleukin-1-beta. It has to get cleaved first. It gets cleaved by caspase-1, the enzyme, but caspase 1 is is also in an inactive form called procaspase 1. Now procaspase 1 has to get activated by typically the inflammasome. So the inflammasomes will activate procaspase 1 including the NLRP3 inflammasome. Now the NLRP3 inflammasome detects a perturbation in the cytosol, it then oligomerizes into a ninja star, it then recruits an adapter molecule called ASC and it, re it recruits thousands of these ASC molecules, and each ASC molecule can recruit a procaspase 1 molecule and activate it. So this is the inflammasome there. Now largely, there are two critical ions involved in here. We need potassium efflux, so we need potassium to leave the cell, and we need chloride to leave the cell. So the question is, with our drug, where in the pathway is it inhibiting? We know it's inhibiting NLRP3. We're in the pathway. Is it inhibiting iron flux? Is it inhibiting NLRP3 activation or ASC recruitment or somehow caspase 1 activation? Where in this pathway is it being inhibited? So first up, we wanted to look at ASC oligomerization. This kind of answers NLRP3 and ASC simultaneously. So to do this, we took macrophages, we genetically engineered them to put a fluorescent probe on the ASC molecule here. So instead of just being a regular ASC molecule, it now fluoresces um, either under a green or a red light. We had both. Now, what's cool about that is ASC is normally floating around the cytosol, but when it gets activated, it forms this large clump that's actually microns wide. It's as big as the mitochondria. It's huge. And so we can actually watch these specks form using live cell microscopy after we activate these macrophages and activate the inflammasome. So here we can see it under normal situations, you can see all the ASC is diffused. That's a whole cell there, pretty much. It's the cytosol of a whole macrophage there. So these diffuse blobs are just macrophages expressing the fluorescent ASC. Now, when we activate them with ATP, for example, um, we end up with these tight, bright specks. Can you see these specks in each of these cells here? There's a good cluster of them. We tried to point to them a little bit because um, in the in the paper, you have to shrink the images so much. But yeah, you can see that there might be about 12 or 13 different specks on this page. It hasn't happened to all the macrophages, but some of the macrophages have these very large specks in. Now with ibuprofen, which is a not, doesn't inhibit the inflammasome, we can see we've still got all these bright white specks throughout the image. Uh, but flufenamic acid, we have no specks. We've still got that diffuse looking macrophage. So the ASC is not oligomerized under flufenamic acid. So when we quantify it, um, specks 
per hype, um, per image basically um, and we express it as a percentage of vehicle we can see that ibuprofen has the same amount of specs whereas methanamic acid and flufenamic acid have both inhibited ASC spec formation so we've inhibited the formation of those inflammasomes so we know it's not this path. We know that this is inhibited, which would suggest that it's upstream. So maybe it's NLRP3 or maybe it's the uh, chloride efflux. But we did also just want to check to see if somehow caspase 1 was being activated. If we were right, if that conclusion was correct, that we have blocked inflammasome activation and the formation of this ninja star, we should see no active caspase. So to do this, we used a western block which sorts proteins by abundance and size. And we did a Western blot for caspase 1. We were looking to see whether the pro-domain had been cleaved off, so now we had active caspase 1. So we know it's not this, is it caspase 1? And so to do this, we do a Western blot. Now this is a dirty Western blot. We actually got way better at these Western blots. It was very hard to find a good antibody and all this kind of stuff. But this is staining for caspase 1. And we know that... This active caspase best correlates with this fragment here. It's the 10 kilodalton fragment of caspase 1. Now, thanks to Kate Schroeder's work up in the University of Queensland, we actually know it's not this fragment that's active, but we do know that this fragment correlates with caspase 1 activity. It's, it's sort of a pre-digestion uh, form of the caspase that's active and then it gets digested down to this 10 kilodalton so it correlates well with the activity of caspase 1 if this blob is darker we know that caspase 1 is more active so um, and when we don't activate it this time we used a bacterial toxin to activate the inflammasome called nigericin when we don't put nigericin on we don't get active caspase 1 when we do put nigericin on here we do get caspase 1 so if we have a look there when we've got nigericin and no other drugs, we do get this active caspase 1 fragment. When we look at the ibuprofen, it has gone down just a little bit, just a hint of activity there, but not significantly. That dark blob there is still roughly the same size as this, maybe a little bit further down, but not too bad. Um, but then when we look at flupenemic acid, we've completely, almost completely got rid of the active caspase 1 component of this western block. And so, well, man, we made the blots way better later on. I wish we could republish our data. Um, and so we've sort of confirmed this again and again and again with less speckle and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of optimizing to Western blots. Um, but yeah, we can see flupenamic acid is blocking the formation of active caspase 1. Oh, look at that. Okay, so next, um, I didn't expect that. Okay, so next we wanted to figure out, okay, it's interacting with something. I don't know, we still don't know what. We know it's blocking the spec formation. We don't know if it's directly binding to the spec or what's going on there. Next, we kind of wanted to figure out maybe, because we're trying to narrow it down and we're still and in nowhere we just know that nlrp3 is inhibited we still haven't narrowed down any specific proteins it could be a never-ending hunt but we kind of wanted to know what kind of inhibitor it is so there's two major kinds of inhibitors um there's a uh, a drug inhibitor might come in and occupy the spot that the uh, normal signaling molecule will work through or it'll somehow bind to the protein and prevent it from making that conformational change so if there's an enzyme it might fit into the enzyme without cleaving if it's a receptor it might fit into the receptor like this without activating the receptor so that's a drug inhibitor and so it might be doing this now there's two kinds um, and so now you can see the signaling molecule can't get into the pocket because it's been occupied by the drug inhibitor now sometimes drug inhibitors can be irreversible and that means that they may be permanently bind to their target so they really lock themselves in here we've got the, this binding to that receptor there and so then you can't wash it out you can't get rid of it and it's not until that protein gets digested by the cell and a new receptor is produced that that drug will stop working so these are very potent long-lasting drugs because they permanently bind to their drug target and that's called an irreversible inhibitor now a reversible inhibitor is different it will go into the pocket but then it will come out of the pocket and then it'll go back in in the pocket and so they'll actually kind of take turns between the signaling molecule and the reversible inhibitor and what you can do is saturate it with reversible inhibitor so that more often than not it's another drug that comes in and replaces the drug so there's far more drug than signaling molecules so you drown it out and that's a reversible inhibitor
So we wanted to know that. And so what we did was we did our macrophage prep where we did the macrophages, treated them with LPS, treated them with ATP. But we treated them with our drugs before we treated them with ATP. And then we tried to wash our drugs off. So we treated them with the drug for 5 to 10 minutes. And then we did three replacements of the media to really wash our drug off. And then we gave the ATP after we'd done that washing to see if we could reverse it. Right, So here we can see with no wash, flufenamic acid is very potent. So when the drug is there, when we try to activate the inflammasome, it's very potent. But when we wash it, we can wash it out. So we can wash out flufenamic acid. Now in this experiment, and we can wash out methanamic acid, in this experiment we had a reversible inhibitor. This is a caspase inhibitor that we know is a reversible one. And we had this drug, um, m &S, which we know is an irreversible inhibitor. It binds permanently to its drug target. And so it didn't wash out. And so this was really nice confirmation that we had a reversible inhibitor. It was inhibiting something, not sure how, but it is at least reversible. That's helping to narrow down potential targets there. So next up, we wanted to look at these iron fluxes, potassium and chloride. And we actually got some collaborators involved who could do electrophysiology. So they could actually measure based on the manipulation of the electrical currents in these macrophages they could measure whether whether positive cation flux was still occurring or negative iron flux was still occurring in the presence of the drugs so this group really helped us out in figuring out which iron may be being interfered with with our drug so first up they looked at potassium flux so this is a positive ion so they're looking for positive ion flux and what's happening to that um, in our macrophages when we are uh, with and without the drug and what we can see at 100 percent that's our control and so both the flufenamic acid and methanamic acid are not significantly different from our control so they are performing they're having the exact same amount of potassium flux or positive ion flux um, with the treatment of flufenamic acid and methanamic acid as our control. So this suggests these drugs are not modifying potassium efflux. So we know it's not potassium efflux. Next they look at chloride efflux or negative ion flux is probably more specific. Um, and what they saw there was that flufenamic acid and methanamic acid actually inhibited negative ion flux, whereas ibuprofen and diclofenac had no effect on negative ion flux. So here we found out something quite important and pretty cool. We found out that NLRP3, uh, NLRP3 inhibiting uh, NSAIDs were inhibiting negative iron flux, which is awesome, suggesting that we were modifying uh, chloride flux, um, and that was what was modifying the NLRP3 inflammasome. A real important point here is that the literature hadn't quite established that negative iron flux was critical to NLRP3. So this was a really surprising result, is we were starting to be some of the first um, people that were drug targeting this negative iron flux in order to target the NLRP3 inflammasome. Very, very cool stuff. Now there's a lot of negative iron channels that might be responsible for this negative iron flux. But one that we thought might be it is uh, uh, a channel called BRAC or volume regulated anion channel. Anion mean negative ion, so it's a vo volume regulated chloride uh, channel basically. So could it be this guy? So next we did a couple of experiments. What we did was we did flufenamic acid, methanamic acid, and here we did uh, chloride inhibitors. These are non-specific drugs that inhibit chloride channels. And we found that they also inhibited the inflammasome. So this is a really important step. It shows that just inhibiting all chloride flux does inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome. As I said, the literature hadn't really settled on whether negative ion flux was critical in the NLRP3 activation. So it was really important for us to show that. But next we actually found a, a drug that is a, a supposedly very selective BRAC inhibitor. So it just inhibits this one receptor volume regulated anion channel. Essentially what this channel does is as the cell begins to swell up, the volume regulated anion channel will open up to allow chloride to, eat, to leave. And with osmosis, where an ion goes, water goes. So water follows ions. So salt sucks, that's osmosis. So as this chloride ion leaves, water will follow it. So the idea is that as the cell stretches, the channel opens, that allows the chloride out, and then the water goes out with it, and then it allows the cell to relax, right? So um, 
uh, yeah, we tested the specific VRAC inhibitor, and it too inhibited uh, IL-1 beta release. So we've got IL-1 beta release here. When we put the ATP on, which we know activates the uh, NLRP3, we get IL-1 beta release. And when we put the specific VRAC inhibitor on, it blocks it. So our drugs are acting exactly like VRAC inhibitors. And this is sort of the first time that VRAC had been specifically identified as an NLRP3 inhibitor and targeted with drug targets. So it was a very, very exciting result. Um, and so, uh, figure two and three, we're in the pathway our inside NLRP3 inhibitors working. Um, we think it's likely a reversible VRAC inhibitor preventing chloride efflux. And this inhibits NLRP3 activation and ASC-SPEC oligomerization, which we showed with the fluorescent tag, and caspase cleavage, which we showed with the Western block. And so, yeah, this is where we think our drug is working. And by and because chloride efflux is essential for NLRP3 activation, by inhibiting VRAC, we have inhibited NLRP3 uh, forming. Now, the big twist in the tail that happened several years later is we generated a VRAC knockout mouse, and they had regular NLRP3 activation. Um, and our flufenamic acid still worked in an NLRP3, in a VRAC knockout mice. So, we're not sure. It could be that it is working through VRAC, and when you knock out VRAC, another protein is upregulated that's very similar to VRAC, and our, uh, our VRAC inhibiting NSAIDs actually inhibit a range of anion, um, anion fluxes, negative ion effluxes, so chloride effluxes. Um, and actually, we're, we're confirmed it time and time again with some very clever experiments um, involving things like sodium um, gluconate. Yeah, um, some very specific experiments we've shown that chloride efflux is definitely essential for inflammasome activation. And VRAC is probably involved as one of the channels that allows anions. The problem is, is that there's probably lots of channels that allow chloride efflux and that our drugs just happen to block all these channels. So it seems like a dirty drug and a dirty process allowing lots of chloride out through a lot of different receptors there. That's just a little twist in the tail. It happened about three to four years after we published this paper.